Hello and welcome to With the First Link, the podcast that hopes to make our future as bright and as just as the one that we see in Star Trek The Next Generation. And we think that one way to do that is to recap and discuss the entire series, one episode at a time, doing our best to look at it all through an anti-oppression, pro-diversity, anti-racist lens. I am Ruthie Cowper Samoshi. And I'm Matthew Simone, and today we'll be talking about Where Silence Has Lease. This episode was written by Jack B. Sowards and directed by Winrich Colby. It first aired on November the 28th, 1988. So in this episode, the crew of the Enterprise find themselves feeling really trapped and they have no power. And uh, they just, yeah, just feel super out of control and... And it's scary. So let's talk about times that we have felt powerless or out of control. You want to start? Yeah, I was thinking kind of about um, society as a whole, like over the course of the pandemic. Sure. And I know that it was like a scary situation where, we, you know, I was thinking about kind of like the crew here is that you feel all of a sudden you're enveloped by this thing. So they're they're like approaching this phenomenon and at first the phenomenon sees like it's it's far off and they're not like right near it and then all of a sudden it's like whoop it's around you and yeah. i was like oh that was like you know in january of 2020 we heard about this virus on the horizon and you're like oh okay it's this thing that's far off and then all of a sudden it was like whoop it's around you and you're you're inside and you're stuck yeah and you can't like back you can't reverse direction you can't get out of it uh, you're just there and you know, in this episode, as we'll see, they the, the Enterprise crew proceeds to understand that, like, they're being experimented on. Some people started to feel that way about the pandemic, that it was like, oh, maybe this is some kind of, like, social engineering. Mm. And I think I can understand why some people might revert to that, because I, I think when people feel powerless um, and almost like there's there's no, like, none of your faculties are, are required or needed or work in a given situation, you might want to create narratives to help you feel more in control. And yeah. I think that's where some conspiracy theory comes from. But, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't necessarily thought of that. But in you talking about, like, yeah, the crew realizing that they are being experimented on, that they are subjects of, of an experiment. Yeah. It just sort of made me think that, like for, I'll speak for myself, like when I feel powerless, I can definitely understand the desire to kind of appeal to some kind of higher power mm-hmm. who does have control. So like I, in a similar vein, I was thinking something that I feel powerless about is when when I see policy decisions get made that are just so harmful. And I do have power in that I can vote and I can protest and I can write letters and, and I... I do as much of that as I can, and it's really frustrating when those tactics don't seem to work. So I can, yeah, I can understand this desire to sort of put the blame on, even if it's like a faceless or nameless being, to kind of be like, well, there's there's someone who is experimenting on me, or there's someone who could fix this. That very same reasoning progresses in the episode, right? At first, yeah. they're like, there has to be some kind of intelligence at work here. Yeah. And and then eventually, they kind of re- keep re-inquiring with Troy. And finally, Troy's like, oh, you're right. There is something that's kind of at work here. And it turns out that there is. But I can also see the same logic play out when there's some other large situation that you feel enveloped by. And eventually, at some point, you might, you're right, you might like sort of invent a narrative or a being or a thing that has to be at work in this situation but it might be like a completely natural phenomenon or it might be a natural phenomenon but that has been exacerbated by like totally measurable ways like yeah i'm thinking about that like right now in bc like a bunch of bc was underwater yes. um you know recently and you know there's always conversation like when this happens it's like oh well, this is a natural phenomenon this is it's just weather and you're like well no it's it's not just natural because Climate change models have been predicting that we're going to be getting more rain like this. And then we've also been cutting back vegetation that would prevent flooding and help with like water absorption. And infrastructure has aged. And so it's not exactly a natural phenomenon. But it's it's also not like some kind of conspiracy to against people. Right. So it's it's trying to understand, I think, the difference between the two and how things like generally work. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people will say things along the lines of everything happens for a reason. And right. and and so they'll kind of, again, like create a narrative where 
not saying everything happens for a reason, as in everything has a cause, like the causes that you just mentioned to the flooding in BC. Like there, there were actual causes of that, and you could say those are the reasons that <laughs> that it happened. Yeah. But yeah. more like everything happens for a reason. Like so, because of this horrible thing that I'm living through, I will come out stronger, and that's the reason. And I think that that can be really comforting. But I also think that that can sometimes like take away our agency. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think that like it, it still proceeds from a place of ego. Right? Yes. <laughs> Is that it's like things happening for a reason to me yeah. so that things are okay. And either it's – if things are targeted toward you for either positive or negative reasons, there's still like an ego centrism to that, to yeah. that argument. Yeah. Like it's from time to time I get asked some of these philosophical questions at the end of a planetarium show. And like it's like what's what's the meaning of it? Right. Like why, you know, we're here in this universe and how did it get started and like what's the meaning of it? Like are we inside of some giant Nagilum right. experiment, right. you know, like yeah. in the universe? Who's the Nagilum then? What's their intent? And I my best answer to that, and I I'm borrowing it from Carl Sagan, and I'm I'm paraphrasing it, but basically he said, Well, the the meaning of life is to create your own meaning. Right. Right. And and not in a way that's like, well, you know, the, there's the purpose is bestowed upon you, but you create your own purpose as an individual. And I think that's where the agency comes from. I mean, I think there is something sort of beautiful in people's desire to find meaning in things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like I like I said, like, I think we also need to when we can, we need to take that the power that we have and realize the agency that we have to make our own meaning and to yes. not, and to make our own reasons for things and not just sort of be like, well, it's all part of some divine plan. Right. Yeah. Not to divine that what the meaning is from another source, but to create, well, this experience happened to me. Here's what I personally learned from it. Or yes. here's how I've grown. Yes. And here's how I'm choosing to take this experience yes. to the extent that, that we can make those choices. I think we should. In some way, I think we're, we all... We are all powerless in a way to, yeah. like, to many degrees. And it's, it's sometimes it's trying to find what is the one choice or decision that you can make. And I think that's what, where the crew eventually gets to. It's pretty. It's kind of a dark place that they it eventually is. get to, but has a has a, a positive resolution. As we'll it get does. To. But I also think just in that thing of like we're all powerless, I think that that's scary. And at the same time, that can be sort of comforting because – Mm -hmm. When we realize that we don't have power over everything, I think that we can then take the power that we have and, you know, worry about those things, the things that we do have control over. Like the idea, and I, I remember hearing this so much as a kid and not, I don't know, not necessarily believing it, not fully understanding it, but like the idea of like, you can't control what other people do, you can only control what you do. And I think that that is... Like, I think when you're a kid, that can be a difficult thing to hear because you have so, you have such little control over so many things. But as an adult with a lot more power, I I really can control how I respond to things. I really can control how I enforce boundaries. I can control what actions I take as a result of the things that I can't control. Yeah. Whether it's going into self-destruct mode or something else. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we get into the episode? Let's do it. So what happens in this episode, Matthew? In this episode, the Enterprise gets stuck in a mysterious void in space, which causes strange things to happen on the USS Enterprise. I feel like that could describe probably more than one episode. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. <laughs> but that... It's like... That's like every episode, yeah. Matthew. Weird that's things pretty, happen. That's true. Actually, you know, I do want to side note, just I've been rewatching Lower Decks and I have to say one thing that I really appreciate is when they like call out sci-fi stuff. Y yes. When they, they, they literally say like, oh, we're going to go do more sci-fi stuff. And because I feel like that is actually how we talk about like when people talk about smartphones or like, I don't know, the the metaverse or whatever people are always like yeah it's all we're living in the future now so i think it makes sense that you, when weird things happen you'd call it sci-fi even i i agree with yeah. you yeah i think that the show is pretty self-aware so good and i think it it definitely rewards people who have watched next generation oh, yeah so, yeah. <laughs> yeah so picard enters the bridge from the ready room and he's kind of like 
there's something on his mind. Yeah. He's worried about something. There's this eerie music playing. He leaves the ready room. He's thinking about going back in. And then he tells Troy. Uh, he sits down beside her. And he's worried about. He, she's like, are you worried? About which one of them? He's like, I'm, I'm worried about both. And Worf and Riker. And we don't know what's going on with no. them. No. And then he says, I can't wait until they stop saying things like this. He's like. I think it is perhaps best to be ignorant of certain elements of Klingon psyche. Yeah. Yeah, I think we they also haven't really figured out Worf's character yet. So <laughs> they they're really experimenting haven't. with things and this is one of those experiments. So we cut to Worf and Riker. They're on the holodeck. But it, we don't know that yet because they're... We don't know that yet. It looks true, like yeah. they're like on the surface of a planet. It's very suspenseful. It's like... Things are in ruin and they're all dusty and gross and yeah, it's like a almost like a jungle or something. Yeah, with yeah. like some built things as well. It's like yeah, it's dirty and gross and it looks like I've been traveling on foot. And Worf picks up a gauntlet with like these, like it's like a spike glove. Yeah, thing. and then it's the awesome. thumb is like this one massive spike. Yeah. Okay, is it a Gorn that drops from above? It looked like a Gorn to me. It looks like some kind of like. A reptilian skeletor. Isn't that what a Gorn looks like? Gorns have eyes and stuff, though, and this thing's more of like a skeleton face. Gorns have like a snout, and they look more like walking crocodiles. All right. Well, they're they're two they're two creatures, aliens. I don't know. They fight. Riker does a good job, actually, of fighting. Yeah, Riker's looks like a giant insect person. Yeah. They make them look like alien. They're like monsters in the classic form. Yeah, yeah. They don't look like. The- aliens that we generally see on star trek yeah they're not nice enough looking to be on the bridge <laughs> these are the ones that we hack up in the holodeck yes <laughs> yeah and then at one point like it looks like this the skeletor one that uh that Worf was fighting looks like Worf is gonna like get killed but he eventually like gets the upper hand and then he picks up the skeletor's weapon and like starts to go after riker yeah, it's like he's in some kind of, like, blood rage. Yeah, he's, like, growling, and Riker's like, the exercise is done, but he doesn't stop until Riker says, at ease. Yeah, he's like, at ease, Lieutenant. Yeah. Uh, pulls rank and gets him to calm down. And I guess they're trying to give this impression that Worf is still, like, this loose cannon that we don't know. He's a Klingon, he's a warrior, and maybe he could snap, you know? Yeah. Is he, is he really in control? We don't know. But I like to think, based on how Worf's character was developed later, I like to think that this is just Worf kind of having fun. And he wanted to wrestle with Riker. He thought that would be a fun part of his calisthenics program. Yeah, so he's invited him in. Yeah. and So Riker's like, you do this every day? <laughs> and he's like, usually my calisthenics are more intense. But those sessions are too personal to be shared. I'm really curious as to what that means. What kind of calisthenics are personal? Also, does anyone use that term anymore? Calisthenics? Uh, it's not something that I hear on a regular basis. <laughs> No, is that like an exercise term that people use in the 80s more? I think so. I <laughs> a calisthenics is an exercise term. I do know that. And it does have a bit of an 80s ring to it. Like people in sweatbands doing like like jazzercise and stuff. That's what I imagine. Remember back in the 80s we used to have those like, you know, people oh, yeah. in no, like tights Very and well. sweatbands. Body when he, when he says calisthenics, that's what I think of, which is not this. Anyways. <laughs> I'm looking holiday. it up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, calisthenics are exercises that uh, you use your own body weight. So it's like you don't need equipment necessarily. That's but not what this is. They were literally fighting other bodies with weight. I don't know. Anyways. I don't know. Anyway, they leave the holodeck. And they leave the holodeck. It's a bit, it was an interesting like opening because yeah. it doesn't really have anything to do with the episode. Like there's a thing later on that maybe connects back to it, but it almost yeah. feels like a sort of cold open that's just like fun and a bit of a fake out. Yeah, they and they do this. A, a lot in TNG yeah. uh, to varying degrees of success. Uh, <laughs> we have the intro and then the Enterprise is on a mission to Morgana, the Morgana Quadrant. Yeah. Which I, I don't think they've determined what quadrants are yet no. in Star Trek either. Yeah. Uh, but they encounter a hole in space that keeps appearing and disappearing. There's no pattern. It looks kind of like a, a smudge. It does. It's like the, if you if you like rubbed the... You know, the, the painting that is stars on the view screen. You just kind of yeah. smudge it. Um, yeah. But it's different from a wormhole. And Data, I think, is kind of wise about this. People keep asking him what it is. And he's like, the sensors indicate that it's like literally nothing, like the absence of everything, no matter, no energy. And he's he says like the most elementary statement in science is, I don't know. 
and he doesn't know. It resonated with me because I had actually had a conversation very similar to this in the planetarium earlier that uh, the day that I watched this episode. Someone had asked me, like, what, how do we know what happens inside of a black hole? Right. And I was like, we, we don't because literally the edge of a black hole is called the event horizon. Beyond that point, we can't see events anymore. And if we can't observe something in science, because that's how science works, yep. we need to be able to observe it. If we can't ha- make observations or get data, we can't make any conclusions about it. That's how science works. And so when Picard says, oh, that data's analysis isn't very scientific, I'm like, no, it's it's very scientific. He's yeah. telling you that without any information, he doesn't know what it is. And he's like, I do not know what that is. Yeah. And I think also like there's, again, there, there that can be really uncomfortable. I remember getting in a bit of an argument many, many years ago with the idea of like, teaching creationism in schools with with someone someone was talking about that and what they were saying this was not like a person it was in university i didn't really know the person it was part of a class so it's but this person was saying we can't just say what we don't know where things come from and i was like no we actually can like yeah but she was like we can't teach that and i was like what no but if you don't know you can't just like Say something that you have no evidence for. It's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Like you, that, that you have to have an answer. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of goes back to our opening conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Where it's like you, you, if you don't have an answer to something, you feel powerless. So you start creating something yourself. Right. Or relying on, you know, stories and – but that, but again, things that there's no evidence for. Right. There's just yeah. like lore around it. Whoa. Trust data, not lore. Wesley, I don't really understand his point here, but he's like <laughs> – if it's he's like if it's an ordinary hole, wouldn't we be able to see what's behind it? I also I like, don't fully that's... understand the point, but I love how like uh, Picard taps him on the shoulder, like, "Oh, you're so wise, young Wesley." You're so smart, <laughs> yeah, young Wesley. And I'm like, "Well, space is technically like already a hole. We can we already see what's behind? There's no behind. Anyways, it doesn't. <laughs> I was like, I don't really understand what the point. Anyways, Troy can't sense anything from it. Yeah, Data can find no record of anything. No record. Ever. Nothing. Yeah. No federate. And so they're excited. They're like, oh, well, we find something yeah. no one's found before. So they, yeah, they they launch a scanner probe and you can hear the sort of beeping of the probe. And then you get a little like static and it cuts out right <laughs> as it enters the hole. Yep. Worf goes, was like, we should go to yellow alert. And people are like, "What? why? <laughs> yeah. And he gets really like uncomfortable. And like at first he doesn't want to say anything. And Picard is like, no, like it's the ship operates better when the crew like can communicate and tell me what's like tell me what's on your mind and he's got he Worf has in his mind an, an old Klingon legend of a gigantic space creature that could devour entire vessels and it's interesting like he apologizes and he's like you know that's not I shouldn't be worried about that I'm a trained security officer I shouldn't be worried about old legends but actually like after that they sort of cut to Riker and Riker kind of looks like he doesn't disagree like he's also worried about that kind of thing. Yeah, I I, I think it's funny because there's there's like a long history later on with Star Trek with Worf just getting endlessly shut down I on the know. bridge when he, when he like brings up ideas. <laughs> no, this, Worf, I think no it's why he's, no. <laughs> yeah, he's a little timid here at first because he's like I don't he's like a giant space creature. Yeah, it's the unknown, right? It's like yeah. I don't know what this is. I don't know how to respond to it. It's like the exact opposite of what they've just demonstrated, Worf feels comfortable in, which is a direct threat that you can hit with an axe. Right. Like that's, yeah. that's what he wants. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. So, but now this is just like a blob in space. It's scary. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, I guess we should go to yellow alert. Like he's more scared of this nothingness than he is of some skeletor beast with a sword. You know, I, I can also relate to that a little bit because I I wouldn't say I'm afraid of the dark. Like that seems too simplistic. But sometimes like when it's dark out and I'm like, walking alone and it's like quiet I I, yeah. I sort of imagine things and there was one time when I like heard something I was like walking down a residential street I wasn't like in the woods by any means but I also wasn't like it wasn't bustling and I heard something and I got kind of like creeped out and then I told myself Maybe it's a bear. And as soon as I imagined, there was no way it was a bear in downtown Toronto. Let's just be clear about that. But as soon as I imagined <laughs> it as a bear, I felt more comfortable. 
right now it's a it's a it's a thing that yeah. you can you know how big it is how fast maybe it can move yeah i i couldn't yeah. fight it off but i i don't know i just with a concrete threat i felt more comfortable than with yeah. like a an abstract and at one point that's what he's he says like they've been firing probes into it and he's like well let's shoot it let's fire a yeah. torpedo at it <laughs> yeah and they're like no no no, no like, we're no. not gonna do that work. but but Riker does say he agrees with Worf he's like we should be careful like they move in closer to it and he's just like he's like let's be careful but then the hole moves towards them yeah, it just like swallows them. So you look at the, you're looking at the view screen. It just goes like, whoop, and yeah. it swallows the ship. Yeah. And then like the the earlier Star Trek action music kicks in, like, dee, 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 dee. yeah. Whatever it is, sir, we seem to be inside it. Okay, this is something I realized that I it didn't I didn't really clue into the fact that they did this, and I kind of wonder how often they 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 do this. I'm gonna keep an eye out for it because it's like the hole envelops them, and then the bridge can't communicate with the rest of the ship. And then there's a commercial break, and right after that, there's like a log that's like, communications with the rest of the ship have returned to normal. So it's like just to keep you in suspense over the commercial break. Yeah, the pre pre commercial break suspense. But it's like it's solved right away. It, yeah, it wasn't. A, it's not a <laughs> Netflix designed plot. Definitely uh, not. That one, yeah. yeah. So Picard and Riker are reminiscing. They're still not super worried at this not point. Not yet. They're being chill, and Picard and Riker reminisce about ancient history. Uh, course at Starfleet Academy where people were <laughs> talking about people believing the earth was flat and I was like yeah okay I remember hearing or reading somewhere that like people never actually that was never really a widespread belief people talk about right? it as though it was but like like I, I mean they talk about how like Riker and Picard talk about they say that crews like at sea would threaten to hang their captains if they wouldn't turn back because they were afraid of falling off the edge of the world. But I remember right. reading something that was like, no, they could tell that it wasn't flat because of how like shadows work and how and like, yeah, they I don't know. So yeah. So technically speaking, uh, given that that belief may not have been as widespread at that time that we think and that the Earth's population was smaller, there actually might be more flat earthers in present day than there were. Then. Yes. That could be the case. This is where ah! we are. <laughs> Anyways, Wesley now says, okay, wait a second. They actually have no communications with outside of the void. So while they didn't have internal oh, yeah. communications yeah, yeah, yeah. before, yeah. now we don't have external communications. We can't talk to anybody. We are cut off. Yeah. So Pulaski comes to the bridge and she's like, I don't understand what's going on. And Picard is like, yeah, no, don't worry. We don't either. She mentions not being a bridge officer, but like she's the chief medical officer. Yeah. And I... Does that mean was Crusher then not a bridge officer either? I always like, assumed that, Crusher was. I think it makes sense because like people have stations that are on the bridge. Like Data's station yeah. is on the bridge. Jordy can go back and forth because there is an engineering station on the bridge. Right, and he he started the show as a bridge officer. Like. As a bridge officer, so maybe it's like it just became custom for for mm. Crusher to be on the bridge, but that's not really her post so maybe she's like i i know i'm not technically supposed to be yeah i think they're actually no now that i'm thinking about this because there's a later episode i don't want to get into too much with spoilers and stuff but a character has to like go through an evaluation to become a full bridge officer even though they were on the bridge before that there's like a special title so i think you need to be in like a certain you need to pass some test in like a level of command anyway we'll get into it they're asking data to kind of magnify what they're seeing on the screen but because there's nothing there, like nothing's happening when he magnifies. And then <laughs> for anyone tracking what whether I'm a fan of Pulaski, I'm definitely not right now <laughs> because she's like, it does know what it's doing, doesn't it? And then realizes that she has to call Data him, not it, because he's not an yep. it. And then she's like, I'm not accustomed to working with non-living devices. And then like apologizes for that again because... Her, his service record says that he is alive and she's like I must accept that and like dude have this conversation in your head like don't say yeah. it. I mean it's bad enough that you think these things but the fact that you feel so comfortable saying them out loud and you're not like immediately kicked off the bridge for saying that you don't actually believe an officer is alive is so problematic yeah it's pretty rough and then data data has this little coy smile yeah. <laughs> when she's like i guess i have to accept that you're alive it says that you're alive in your service record yeah but imagine also that it has to say in your service record that you're alive <laughs> data would data not be considered alive unless starfleet had said so yeah 
That's 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 an issue. Like you'd think that that would be more under the Federation charter and not under his Starfleet service record. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, that's coming up later this season. Yeah. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. But also, I wonder, like, does everybody's service record say they're alive? Like, does yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, does Pulaski's service record say that she's alive, or is it just androids? Yeah, the one android. Oh, more of that coming up this oh, season. I yeah. think. That might be why, now that I think about it, it might be why some of these conversations keep coming up this season oh, with Pulaski. Yeah. She becomes kind of a foil leading up to yeah. that episode, which is coming. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. Picard calls to engineering and is like, hey, are we moving? Because, like, things are messed up. Yeah. And then Data gets philosophical about yeah, it. Yeah, he's like, and it makes sense, right? He's like, okay, if this void ha- is is dimensionless, like, can we even move in it at all? Like, is is no dimension also a dimension? Yeah. Which I was like, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, and Picard is like, this is fascinating. Let's get out of here. Yeah, they still they still think they can leave at this point. Yeah, I it's think. weird to me that as soon as they were enveloped, they didn't try to leave, like, right away. Yeah, they didn't look behind them and say, like, oh, we can't see where we came in yeah. from. So, yeah. like, yeah, so, like, Riker tells Wesley to turn right around and we see on the screen the ship does that and they go but i guess like because there's nothing around them they have no like external point of reference they're like are we even moving like what's what's happening and the music gets creepy and there's a cool like close up on riker's fingers getting all twitchy yeah riker's nervous yeah and picard wants to forge to monitor velocity so he's like they go to warp 2 the, the engines say that they are, I guess, putting out warp two worth of power, but they still don't know if they've gone anywhere. Yeah, I guess they have some kind of internal thing that can be like, we have traveled this much or like based on the the engine power, we should have moved this much. Yeah, like if you look at a car. Yeah. You know, when you're like your speedometer on your car comes from like the spinning of the wheels. Right. Right. But if your car, like, say it was suspended in darkness, you could look at the speedometer and it would say, okay, well, it's 50 kilometers an hour. But you may not know if you're moving anywhere. Right, yeah. And so if you're I just, like, hanging kind of in the on. air, you have no no, no friction to yeah. push you along. Yeah. So they drop a stationary beacon so that they can have, like, a point of reference. And you hear the, like, the beeping from the beacon. And it falls away. And then there's, like, a new signal dead ahead and it's the same beacon and Wesley's like no we've like there's no way we came back around to it we've been moving steadily away from it yes so they somehow have just been like warped into a circle yeah uh, have come back where they are so now things are starting to get like this is tense. even i start feeling claustrophobic at yeah. this point in the episode I'm like oh like you can't get out of a situation and it's just like stuck going in circles and you're like ah Ugh. Ugh. all of a sudden the sensors picked up a cloak ship oh no and now warp's like yes I've got, there's a ship. It's like a thing. I can, I know what that means. It has a cloaking device and a Romulan Warbird decloaks and begins to fire at them. Picard tells Worf, like signal them back that we're going to, we're going to return fire. Fire again. So they, re- they return fire. They fire one torpedo and the Warbird blows up. Yeah. And you see Jordy there and he's like, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, I was like, wow, Jordy, like. Dude, you just like killed how many people are on that ship. You think that maybe they'd be a little bit more, I don't know, yeah, calm about that. But anyway, he's he's just like, yeah, screw those Romulans. We blew them up. Yeah, but but it's weird because, yeah, one torpedo shouldn't do that. But also there's no debris. Yeah, it was way too easy because warbirds are powerful. We've established that. Right. And as you said, there's no debris. So all, that we're suspicious now that this may not be real. And then another ship approaches and it looks exactly like the Enterprise. It's the USS Yamato. Which is mm-hmm. uh, their sister ship. I didn't know they had a sister ship, but I guess. No, I think this is the first time they mention it. Is it also the last time? No, we see the we see the Yamato again. Okay. Yes, but we I I don't know if it, even at this point in the show we know that there even are more than one galaxy class starship. Yeah. So I guess there are more than one. Yeah, that, there's at least two. Yeah, and I think what happens is that the. The first ship bears the name of the class. So the first one would have been the USS Galaxy, I believe. But Oh, anyways. I see. Side story. See. Moving on. Okay. Yeah. The Yamato shouldn't be anywhere near this area. And it doesn't answer their hails. And there are no life signs. Riker and Worf prepare to beam down to the aft station of their bridge 
to surprise whoever might be there, which which I think uh, speaks back to the, the Binars episode. Remember, that was the plan there, too. Oh, yeah. Right. They're going to beam to the back of the bridge and take things over. But when they beam in, Riker is in a corridor, like in a dark corridor that looks very much like the Enterprise corridors. And he's like, and it was funny because he says out loud, this isn't the bridge. <laughs> Just in case, Just in we case you didn't tell. know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then he hears these like really unsettling wailing sounds as he kind of walks through the corridor. And then he hears Worf screaming. So he runs towards the sound. Uh, but then Worf is running towards him and he's like, don't fire. And th- they each heard the other one screaming and were running towards that sound. So that's creepy. And then their communications with the Enterprise kind of get staticky and then cut out entirely. And the transporter chief, who I don't think has a name yet, but it's Cole Meany. Uh, played yeah, it's, by Cole it's, Meany. it's not O'Brien, it's, but it it's is. transporter chief, yeah. No Brian. <laughs> he loses the, the lock on them. Emergency power all of a sudden gets engaged in the Enterprise. So it's like losing power. Yeah. And it loses communication with the ship again. Like from the bridge, they can't communicate the rest of the ship. Yeah, everything goes dark on the bridge. Riker realizes that he and Worf are not on a Federation ship. The walls aren't made of the right material. Uh, they're not tritanium. Yeah. They're made of something beyond their capabilities. They decide to head to the bridge and they step through a door that they expect, I think, to take them to a turbo lift. But it takes them instead right to the bridge, which should be four decks above them. Yeah. So like the, the space and, and dimensions of the ship don't make any sense. Yeah. They're just appearing in random places. Very similar to earlier when they were trying to fly around. Right. Yeah. And then they because then the, they they look back through the door they just came through and there's like another bridge there or maybe it's the same bridge. They can't tell. Back on the Enterprise, another officer is at Wesley's usual spot. And so we see that officer. Yeah. Do we know what their name is? I think it's Haskell. And I'll, I'll just say Haskell, it now. Right. He's a he's a black guy. And he, I think he's only there to be killed. Yeah, unfortunately. Like, I was like, why yeah. is there someone else in Wesley's spot? And then he was killed. And I was like, oh, that's why. And they had to make it a black guy. I believe it's also, if you watch through the, the course of the show, it's the only station on the bridge where people get killed. Oh, that that particular. If Yeah, if you sit in that spot, you, you're you like, that is like the red, that is like the red ensign yeah. spot on the TNG bridge. It's that one console that always explodes right. and kills people. Because someone, someone else died. Was, uh, Q killed someone by like freezing them in that spot in the first season. Yeah, and later on, there's at least one explosion I can think of uh-huh. that kills someone at that station as well. But yeah, if you sit there, you might die. If you sit there and your name is not in the opening credits... Be careful. You're, you might be dead. Yeah. yeah. So he's not dead yet, though. No. And then, like, the power comes back on, and then this this uh, officer, Officer Haskell, gets a fix on stars outside of the void, but they can't get the transporter lock on Worf and Riker. So Picard's like, well, like, we can't leave without them. Haskell's like, but sir, we can get out of here. Like, he doesn't <laughs> care. He's like, screw Worf and Riker. Yeah. I want out. Let's get out of here. So then back on the Yamato... Like Worf, there's another door and Worf sees another bridge through it and he goes through that door and then it's like he's gone through like a loop. He comes back on the bridge that he's already on, but like coming in through a different, like in a different spot. And he's really, he gets really upset about the, the just at the idea that there are two bridges and he's like a... A ship has one bridge and one Riker and one yeah, Worf. Yeah, one Riker, one he's, bridge. And then, so this is where I was like, maybe this was supposed to connect to the opening scene because Riker like has to like grab him and be like pull yourself together and Worf then says to himself at ease lieutenant which is what Riker said to him yeah and he growls at Riker for a second Riker has to kind of like raise his chin at him like a sign of dominance for a bit (laughs) because oh yeah it's kind of like they're they're trying to let on that maybe Worf is a little yeah you know almost out of control for I I'm not sure exactly but Yeah, I, I was going to be like, if you're going to explore some like very strange, confusing phenomenon uh, where you might need more of a science officer, then Worf's not the person to have brought with you. Maybe <laughs> like, not. Maybe not. <laughs> Unless you need a defensive posture, I understand. But yeah. anyways, so Data tries to tow the Yamato with a tractor beam, but it doesn't work. Again, the star fixes are going away. The Yamato begins to fade and they're like, oh, we got to get them out of there because it's like disappearing. Yeah. And so finally, like... What do you call him? No Brian? <laughs> gets no Brian. Yeah, no Brian gets to bring them back. And they, they like, for a second there, you think they're lost because the transporter kind of, like, goes, yeah. but then they reappear. they reappear. And they just, like, 
They just walk off the pad and go inside. And, like, they don't give any credit to No Brian. No Brian should be like, I just saved your lives. Yeah. You probably don't know that. But I just stopped you from being disappeared into oblivion. Yeah. And then the Starfix, like, as soon as they're back, uh, the Starfix, like, disappears. And then on the bridge, like, Riker gets really upset. And he's like, we need to figure out, we need to use all this science, all this technology to figure out a way to get out of here. And Picard gets, like, a really interesting <laughs> look on his face. <laughs> Yeah, he smiles at Riker. He's like, I, I think he appreciates Riker's like open frustration. He's like, let's take all this technology and put it to use or whatever. It's hilarious. I, it's that's interesting. Funny. I had a slightly different thought. I thought that this was where Picard kind of realized that something else was going on. Like, I think, I think Picard at this point is starting to suspect that they're being like toyed with in some way because it's like things are happening specifically to frustrate them. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was I the smile in that moment. I, I interpreted as him being more amused with his first officer <laughs> uh, losing his cool. But they, they do seem to sit, think now. Every time they plot a course to one of these star fixes, it closes on them. Yeah. And when they decide to hold position, it stays open like it's trying to bait them. Yeah. So at that point, Picard's finally like, okay, goes back to Troy and says, "Are you sure you didn't like sense something? Because this seems to be intentional, like you're saying." Yeah. And Troy now says, "Actually, I do think maybe." There is something out there, but it was an intelligence that was so vast that originally you, you couldn't see that it was there. Yeah. And, you know, that you might have only been looking at a small piece of it and not realized it was part of, like, the whole. Right. And then Pulaski uh, brings up the idea of them being experimented on. Some Like, she, she uses the phrase lab rats and says, like, something is testing our responses to stimuli. And so they decide they don't want to satisfy whatever it is that's testing them. They don't want to satisfy its curiosity. So they're not going to go after any of the openings that go back to space. Yeah. And Troy actually senses that that is a good thing. Because when they, as soon as they do that, she's like, yeah, don't satisfy its curiosity. So I think she can sense now that there is a response coming from this intelligence yeah. based on their actions. And then we see a face. It's Nagilam. Yeah. It, it's creepy because it looks like, like almost like a an infant's face it's yeah it's a and it's like green salamandery it's very but with human eyes yeah and again laforge he's got some great lines in this episode because the sensors are picking up still nothing and laforge is like sure is a damned ugly nothing yeah just says it out loud the gillum names some of them yeah so he obviously knows kind of what's going on with them he's like laforge Riker, like he's saying their names and then he says, Data, you're of different construction. Like, interesting. So he you know, notices that some of them are different. Yeah. And then he, he also notices that Pulaski is of a slightly different construction. And he kind of, like, makes her – she, like, sort of jerks around on the bridge a bit. Like, he, you can tell that he's forcing her to move. Yeah. Or I don't know. They call, they call Nagilam it through this whole thing. I don't know if mm-hmm. – I'm not sure what the correct pronouns are. But, yeah, so basically they're like, yeah, Pulaski is a different – Data says gender, but like basically her her plumbing is different and it's how we propagate the species. And then Nagila wants a demonstration of that and she's like, uh, not gonna happen. I thought it was odd that that when he's trying to point out things that are alien or different on the bridge, it's an android and a woman. Yeah. Not not alien species relative to humans right, or anything worf. else. It's like not wharf. It is a woman is a, is as bizarre and strange as a, as an android. How, how it goes. The weirdest, yeah. the weirdest thing you can possibly think of. Nagilam is kind of intrigued by the fact that it, I like the way it, it's like phrased. Like Nagilam's like, you exist and then you cease to exist, and they realize like that's mortality, and then and then it kills Ka- uh, Haskell. So that's yeah. Haskell has this terrible, awful death scene. Yeah. Where he's like screaming in agony, and it's it's really disturbing. And so Nagilam says, "Well, I want to understand more about death." I will get to kill a whole bunch of people. Yeah. It should only take about a third of your crew. And I was like, if you don't know what death is and you want, like, how do you, how yeah. can you make that estimation? Yeah. Where's this prediction it's, coming from? How, where's it coming from? I mean, yeah. it is, to be fair, it is a sort of broad range. It'll take about a third, maybe half of your crew is what, yeah. what Nagila ends up saying. So they meet in the observation lounge and Troy is like, we're not important to Nagila. Like it's, it doesn't care about us. There's a little bit of a back and forth between Pulaski and Worf, because Worf is like, in a battle, 30 to 50% casualties would be acceptable. And Pulaski's like, no, that's appalling. And Riker yeah. points out that this isn't a battle. This is them just being killed, like, almost for yeah. sport. 
So yeah, yeah so Picard is like, all right, I'm not going to stand by and wait for my crew to be slaughtered. I'm going to destroy the ship. Yeah, there's the one decision that they have left. That's yeah. the one thing they have power over. We can Yeah, they're taking that control away from Nagilam, basically. Yeah. Like, you want to see us die? Okay, but we're not going to let you have any fun with it. Yeah, and Pulaski is like, isn't that like curing the disease by killing the patient? And she's like, why do I have the feeling that I got on board the wrong ship? Yeah. <laughs> she's like, why, why Why? do I get the feeling this This was not a good time to join this yeah, crew? This was a bad career move. Yeah. So Picard and Riker go down to engineering and they initiate the auto-destruct sequence. And they have, to, they have this interesting conversation where they're like, how much time should we give everyone to prepare? Yeah. They don't want to make it too rushed, but they also don't want to drag it out he says like cause too much pain you know like and drag out the situation so they decide on 20 minutes 20 minutes nice round figure yeah, Riker says it's a nice <laughs> round figure you know like a good 20 minutes who needs more than that minutes. to prepare yeah to prepare for death and I was like I was thinking about this and I was like if I knew I had to prepare to die how much time would I really would I really want and I'm like yeah I guess 20 minutes is I guess that's pretty good you can have a conversation with <laughs> Whoever you want to talk with or whatever, and then you're, you know, you're good. You're good. <laughs> I, I, no? I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's so funny the way he's like a nice round figure. Like we wouldn't want to go like 23 minutes. That's an odd number. Yeah. It's prime. We don't want to drag it out too yeah. much. Like hours. Just a nice you know, round just sitting figure. there. Yeah. You know. they, and then they go back to prep. So Picard, what do we see him do? He goes back to his quarters. He's listening to like this soft kind of like generic piano music. Yeah. And all of a sudden Troy shows up and says that. You know, maybe destroying themselves won't work, that the decision might be wrong. And and Data's like, oh, you didn't – or sorry, Picard's like, oh, you didn't say that before. But then all of a sudden Data enters. Yeah, and he's got, like, questions about what is death? He's like, what is death? And Picard is like – I it, I think this is more of a guard – like a let down guard moment with him. Yeah. And I think that that's happening because he thinks he's going to die as well. Yeah. So he decides to, to have this conversation with Data. It gives this answer about, like – you know, that some people think that death is transforming into, like, this indestructible form. And then mm-hmm. some people think it's, like, disappearing into oblivion. Right. And then he asks Picard. He's like, so what do you think? And this is one of these few times that we get sort of into this this sort of background of Picard's mm-hmm. maybe, like, philosophical or theological beliefs. And Picard basically says, like, well, when I look at the universe and how it's balanced and, you know, it's perfect harmony between this and that, like, maybe it's beyond anything that we've comprehended what death actually is. Yeah. And I was like, that's that's cool yeah the idea sort of that like it can't be either of those two things because those are things we can conceive of and he thinks death is something that we can't conceive of almost yeah um i do have to say i think uh brent spiner and marita sirtis really both of them really do a good job of like playing their characters with just something slightly off because it's not super obvious at first but you can i felt at least like you can sort of tell that this isn't actually Troy and Data or like that they're right. not acting normal, but it's not it's not super obvious. And then they both start to call him Jean-Luc and that's when Always the card twigs. That's when you know yeah. something's wrong. <laughs> Last time someone did that was when uh, Riker had the Q, Q powers. Q powers. Yeah. <laughs> so they he like looks at them and he's like, because they're like, it's wrong to blow up the ship. It's wrong to do that. We want to take our 50% chance of living yeah, don't force the decision on us. Yeah, and then Picard is like, no, Nagilam, this isn't going to work. And he, I, I like also because they're like, it's wrong, it's wrong. And he's like, yeah, you're right. This is wrong. And then he, yeah. he, he real- and then they disappear. He's like, Data and Troy wouldn't have responded like this. Yeah, and exactly. All of a sudden, because he, he asks the computer where Data is on the ship. And the computer tells him that Data is on the bridge, yeah. where he then messages the captain from yeah. and says, hey, we're out of the void. And Picard doesn't believe it. No, yeah. He looks out the window and you can see the stars. Yeah. The stars are back out Picard's window. He doesn't want to stop the auto-destruct. He tells Wesley to head. He's like, point the ship in any direction and go to warp six. It's, it is a real, he really cuts it really close because he thinks this might still be part of Nagilam's like illusion. We get to like 50 seconds on the auto-destruct clock and we start getting uh like 10 second reminders that the auto destruct is going to happen and I actually did time it and it's like not exactly but it's really close uh Troy says that like she can't sense Nagilam anymore everyone's like navigation is working we're not in that void and it it's actually at like 48 seconds so two seconds away 
that Picard says, okay, abort auto destruct. The computer needs his authorization yeah. to, and then there's like, it's like, Commander Riker, do you concur? And he's like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I do indeed concur wholeheartedly. Yeah, and Picard is like, a simple yes would have been good enough. He's like, I didn't want there to be any chance of misunderstanding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Picard goes to his ready room and Wesley's like, wow, he really held that bluff. And Riker's like, was he bluffing? And I think that's a good question. I think. I don't think he was. Yeah. I I think that uh, he, he would have destroyed it. the ship. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Picard goes to his ready room yeah. and he's like, well, Nagilam, I hope you got what you needed. And then also Nagilam responds. He's on Picard's little like desktop. Yeah. Or laptop computer. Yeah. And Nagilam's like, do you want to... He's like, I got much more than I needed. Do you want to know what it is? And Picard's like, no, I don't. Like, I don't want to know. And Nagilam's like, yeah, you do. And just tells him. He, he's like, you're curious. You're curious creatures and you want to know stuff. So here's what I, I told you. And Nagilam says that that they find no tranquility in, in anything. They struggle against the inevitable. They thrive on conflict. They're selfish, but they also value loyalty. They're rash and quick to judge and slow to change. Uh, and he's like, and I can't believe that you survived for this long. That is a funny thing. Whenever, whenever that kind of thing comes up, like I think Q kind of says it. And I remember it being a mm -hmm. big thing. This is switching universes for a bit. But in Battlestar Galactica, when like the Pegasus shows up and Admiral Kane is like, I can't believe you survived this long, like coddling these civilians. And I always want to be like, okay, but they did survive that long. So he's like, he's like, you're weak. Right. You don't, you, you're, this is ridiculous. You shouldn't even be alive. But like, okay, but they are alive. So clearly there is some strength. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible argument. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, you shouldn't be alive. Like, yeah, we are. So then that's a testament against yeah. whatever your your goals were. Like, we've hit the goalpost. Yeah. You know, or we've, got, we've gone through the goalpost. Yeah. So Picard says, well, maybe they have one, it's... I guess Picard's trying to find common ground here with this with this entity. Yeah. Uh, Picard says, like, well, at least we have curiosity in common. And then Nagilam says, well, like, maybe we'll meet again. And then Picard qualifies. He's like, yeah, but next time it'll be out here among the stars. I guess, like, in a way, like, not cowarding inside of your little hole in space. We're yeah. going to meet here on our terms. It's, it's an interesting thing that Picard says because, again, that's not something that he would have any control over. Mm -hmm. Because, like, he didn't. I mean, I don't know. It's not clear where Nagilam exists, if this is like a different dimension that could be accessed from like anywhere. But and yeah, it is It is interesting. Like I feel like Nagilam has so much power that it could just choose to like envelop them again. And But basically Riker, not Riker, Picard, I kind of think that he's almost saying that as a challenge to Nagilam. Like how would you do on a level playing field? You know? Right. Like he's saying, yeah. if, if we weren't at your mercy, would you feel unsafe then? Would you, or, you know, like, does does that scare you? The fact that we are not under your control? Yeah, I think, I, I wonder if almost it was just Picard's way to like, just again, showing, like demonstrating their their will. Yeah. You know, yeah. kind of like a force of will, which is what Nikilim seemed to respond to the first time. Yeah. Back on the bridge, Picard tells Wesley to put them back on course. And of course, we have to have, uh, we have to end on a light note because it's Star Trek. So Riker says, hey, I'd steer clear of any holes yeah. and kind of like pats Wesley on the shoulder. And Wesley kind of smiles. And I'm like, dude, I was like, the last person to sit in this chair just died. Like you all watch someone <laughs> die in front of you. And they're like, oh, it's fine. Da -da -da. Yeah. And they fly off and it's the end of the episode because trauma, trauma doesn't really exist in Star it Trek. It really doesn't. At least at this stage. Not day. yet. Okay. I have a, a thought before we close it out. Okay. In what way is Nagilam different from Q? Like, how, how is Nagilam a, a different character from? Is this just a, another kind of Q type of thing, but done more creepily instead of with the sort of light element that uh, John Delancey brings to to it? Or that's a great question. the The feeling I have off the top of my head, I would say Nagilam was way more like psychopathic. He just like, there's no, I don't really get, there's any sense of, like, empathy or care there at all. Whereas with Q, I felt like Q already fairly well understands humanity, but it was almost like he was trying to get humanity to understand itself better. Mm. Like, put it through challenges and tests that would get humanity to respond in a certain way. But I don't remember, I don't think Q ever just arbitrarily kills any of the crew members. No, he freezes. He freezes that guy. Are they permanently dead, though, afterwards? I think don't one they, of them Doesn't is. he thaw them out? I Oh, does I he? can't remember. I don't to remember be now. Oh, now I gotta go back oh, and check geez. that out so that my argument might be moot. Yeah, like he freezes. He also freezes Tasha, and she's okay. Yeah, but I thought he killed someone. 
maybe he did maybe i'm wrong yeah you might be right that he he does kill that member of the crew but like i think with I, I do agree that, like, Nagilam feels like a much more menacing character than Q. With Q, mm-hmm. I, it's a little creepy, and it's, like, not to say, not to, like, let Q off the hook at all. Like, what he does is not okay, but just in terms of, like, how the story is told, I don't feel the same sense of, like you said, you felt, like, claustrophobic when they're in that hole. Yeah. I don't get that feeling with Q, but I definitely get it from Nagilam. Yeah, and and I guess as well that Nagilam is amorphous, like just this kind of like face. Right. And we never see him, even when he's causing damage or injury to the crew, he's not physically present. Yeah. So it's just kind of like all around you, which is what this blob thing was, right? Mm-hmm. It's just all around you, like you can't escape from yeah. it. Yeah. And so I think that adds like a creepy tone to the whole thing. Yeah. And Q at least had a sense of humor. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, I mean, at least they could converse with him while he was yes. being a pain in the butt. Um, I But I, I do kind of get the feeling with with this storyline that it's like taking the idea of Q and then being like, but what if it was actually scary? Like, what if Q, yeah. what if Q felt like a threat instead of a nuisance? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so Nikhil, I'm scary. It's one of these episodes from season two that I'll go back and watch yeah. over again. It's one of the, the classic episodes. I remembered it being not as good as it actually was. I did enjoy it. Yeah, and remember, I'm pretty sure the Nagilam's voice is actually the voice of the custodian yes. from when the bow breaks yes. in the first season. Yes. Oh, I did want to say this, uh, the title of the episode is from a poem. Uh, which is The Spell of the Yukon by Robert W. Service, uh, written okay. in the early 1900s. And it is, it's a long poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will read part of it. But basically what it's about is the character who the, like the, the narrator of the poem was part of the, like, like went to the Yukon as part of the like Klondike gold rush, like to find gold in 1896. The poem is basically about like this character found all this gold, but didn't actually find satisfaction in the gold, but in the end found satisfaction in the Yukon and in the land. Oh. I'll just read the last stanza, if you don't mind. Sure. So, and that, that's where this, this uh, title comes from. There's gold and it's haunting and haunting. It's luring me on as of old. Yet it isn't the gold that I'm wanting so much as just finding the gold. It's the great, big, broad land way up yonder. It's the forests where silence has lease. It's the beauty that thrills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. And so that's that's the ending of the poem. How does that relate to this episode? <laughs> I kind of... <laughs> Try to figure yeah, out what that is. I went on a bit of a... A, a little bit of a Google... Uh, dive to to figure that out i mean i i kind of think it's possible that they just they just liked the the phrase where silence has lease um yeah. but in the ideas of like like these forests where the silence is like so vast that you can feel it but also i i don't know i wonder if the idea of like or the, the gold isn't actually like what this person realizes they value what they value is the search for gold and and i don't know i wondered if that was like if there was something in there with picard talking about curiosity and and like these experiments that nagilam was running that like it's not you're not actually interested in the answer you're interested in i don't know maybe it's a stretch it's a nice poem though nice thanks for finding yeah that. i always appreciate the little the background factoids that you find about the episodes Star Trek Research. Star Trek Brought Research. Brought to you by Ruthie. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of With the First Link. If you liked what you heard, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast provider of choice. Our cover art was created by Nathan Nunn, and you can find more of his work at NathanNunn.ca. Our theme song is An Amazing Adventure by Flame Lion Studio. You can follow us on Instagram or on Twitter at FirstLinkPod or send us an email at firstlinkpod at gmail.com to let us know how you cope with feelings of powerlessness. I'm Ruthie. And I'm Matthew. And when deactivating your self-destruct, make sure there's no misunderstanding. <laughs>